story one of the human boy again this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales the human boy again by eden philpotts story one peter's detective one being from the first the chum and friend of peter's i can tell about his curious ways better than anybody in fact we shared our pocket-money which is always a great sign of friendship and it was understood that if ever i got into trouble when i grew up and was accused of murder or forgery or anything like that which does often happen to the most innocent people peters would give up anything he might be doing at the time and devote his entire life to proving me not guilty i remember well the day he came i was in the big schoolroom at the fire roasting chestnuts and talking to gideon and shortland and fowl were also there the doctor came in with a new boy and said ah there are some of the fellows by the fire peters then he called out to shortland and me and said shortland and maydew this is peters make him welcome and if there are chestnuts going as i suspect share them with him then the doctor went off to have some final jaw with the mother of peters and peters came down the room and said good evening in a very civil and quiet tone of voice he was thin and dark and when he warmed his hands at the fire it was easy to see the light through them he also had a pin in his tie in the shape of a human skull about as big as a filbert nut with imitation ruby eyes we asked him who he was and he said he came from surrey and that his father had been a soldier but was unfortunately dead his name was vincent peters then shortland who is a silly beast and a bully and only in the lower fifth though quite old and in fact his voice has broken down asked peters the footling question he always asked every new boy he said would you rather be a greater fool than you look or look a greater fool than you are of course whatever you answer you must be scored off but young peters seemed to know it anyway instead of answering the question he asked another he said would you rather be uglier than you look or look uglier than you are gideon was interested in this because it showed at once peters must be a cool hand what are you going to be gideon asked and then came out the startling fact that peters hoped to be a detective of crime if you go detecting anything here you'll get your head punched said shortland well, i may or i may not answered peters but it's rather useful sometimes to have a chap in a school who has made a study of detecting things you can begin to-night if you like i said because johnson major's bat was found to have seven tin tacks hammered into it last week when he took it out of the case to give it a drop more oil and if you find out who did that i've no doubt that johnson major will be a good friend to you him being in the sixth and captain of the first at cricket i don't know enough about things yet answered peters besides you have to be sure of your ground in detecting you may make friends or you may not but you will make enemies to a dead certainty in fact that's the drawback to detecting look at sherlock holmes that's only a yarn said gideon but peters wouldn't allow this he evidently felt very deeply about sherlock holmes he is founded on fact in fact founded on thousands of solemn facts said peters the things he does are all founded on real crimes and if anybody is going to be a detective he can't do better than try to be like sherlock holmes in every possible way the tea-bell rang about this time and peters sat next to me and told me a good deal more he said he was very thankful that he was thin like holmes and wiry and had a beak-like nose he asked me if he had the piercing eyes and i could honestly say they were pretty piercing then he brought out a picture of sherlock holmes which he always carried and showed me that with luck when he grew up he ought really to be very much indeed like the great holmes he was learning to play the violin also not because he liked it but because of the importance of doing it in moments of terrible difficulty he said that it soothes the brain and helps it to do its work but not so much while you're learning 
he said that after he had thoroughly mastered a favourite piece of holmes he should be satisfied as there would never be any occasion for him to play more than one piece chaps liked peters very fairly well he was a good footer player and very good at outside right he was fast and told me that speed often made all the difference in the success of a crime case pure sprinting had many a time made all the difference to holmes peters didn't know much in the way of learning but he dearly liked to get hold of a newspaper and read the crimes he didn't find out about johnson major's bat however but he said it wasn't a fair test because he never heard clearly all that went before the crime a few small detections he made with great ease and found the half-crown that mathers had lost in the playground this he did by cross-questioning mathers and making him bring back to his mind the smallest details and then mathers remembered turning head over heels while only touching the ground with one hand to show how it could be done and on the exact spot in some long grass at the top of the playground where he had performed this feat there was the half-crown mathers offered peter sixpence on the spot but peter said it was nothing and wouldn't take any reward he generally knew by the mud on your boots which of the walks you had been and he always could tell which of the masters was taking prep before he went into the room by the sounds or silence he also had a very curious way of prophesying by certain signs if the doctor was in a good temper or a bad one he always knew this long before anybody else and it was a very useful thing to know naturally but peters did not really do much till his own guinea pig was found dead at his lair about halfway through his second term at merivale he did not care for animals in a general way excepting as helping to throw light on crime which it seems they are very much in the habit of doing though not intentionally but this particular guinea pig was far from a common creature being a prize angora pig and having been given to peters during the christmas holidays by a friend of his dead father it had long hair and looked far more like one of those whacking chrysanthemums you see than a guinea pig it was brown and yellow and had a round nose like a rabbit and seemed so trusting and friendly that everybody liked it one other boy namely james had a guinea pig also because these were the days before we took to keeping lizards and other things in our desk which was discovered by a dormouse of mine coming up through the ink-pot hole in my desk under the doctor's nose and so giving itself away and though the pig of james was a good white pig with a black patch on his right side and one little dab of yellow fur where his tail would have been if he had had one yet compared to the guinea pig of peters he was nothing james however didn't mind the loss of admiration for his pig and he offered peters to let the pigs live together which would be better for both of them because a guinea pig is the most sociable thing in nature and are known well to pine and even die if kept in single captivity but peters had a secret fear that the pig of james was not sound in its health he told me that he had made a most searching examination of james pig and discovered a spot of pink skin on its chest he said it might be nothing but on the other hand it might be some infectious disease also james's pig was inclined to go bald so he thanked james very much and said he thought that if the pigs saw each other through the bars from time to time it would be all they wanted to brace them up and cheer them but he thought upon the whole they had better not meet james didn't like this he was rather a rum chap in many ways but very good at english grammar and chemistry and he had invented a way of cribbing while a master was actually in the room that many copied afterwards james got rather rude about the guinea pig of peters and seemed to think in some way that it was the pig and not peters that had decided not to live with his pig he said one day when looking at the champion pig i suppose the little beast thinks it's too big a swell to live with my honest short-haired pig all the same if they had a fight i know which would jolly well win so do i said peters if a racehorse had a fight with a cart horse the cart horse would win this is not a prize-fighting pig 
west was there and said the same he of course understood all about prize-fighting owing to his brother being winner of the middleweights at the championship of the army and he said that if these pigs fought the superior weight of james's pig behind the shoulder would soon settle it besides of course the other one's hair streamed all over it like a sky terrier's you could see at a glance that it was never born to be a fighter however if you want a fight said peters who was always cool and polite owing to copying sherlock holmes if you want a fight james i can oblige you they were both fourteen and a half and james was a lot fatter but not so tall as peters no said james i don't want a fight i didn't mean anything of the sort i may be able to get you a guinea pig like mine next holidays said peters and if i can i will i don't want it said james i don't care about these guinea pigs that look like pen wipers gone mad i'd rather have mine this of course was mean and paltry jealousy and we rotted james till we rather got his wool off a week afterwards the champion pig was found dead on its back with its paws in the air and its eyes open but dim they had a look of fright in them and it was very interesting indeed this happening to peters because it would be sure to show if his detective powers were really worth talking about of course everybody said it must be james and james said and also swore that it was not peters told me privately that he was trying to keep a perfectly open mind he said there were many difficulties in his way because in the event of a human being dying and being found stark you always have a post-mortem followed by an inquest whereas with a mere guinea pig belonging to a boy in a school there is not enough publicity he said that up to a certain point publicity is good and beyond that point it is bad sherlock holmes always set his face against publicity until he'd found out the secret then he liked everybody to know it though often not until the last paragraph of the story that showed his frightful cleverness i said i suppose you will ask yourself what would holmes do if one evening while he was sitting improving watson there suddenly appeared before him a boy with a dead guinea pig and peter said no because a guinea pig in itself would not be enough to set the great brain of holmes working if there were several mysterious murders about or if there had been some dark and deadly thing occur and holmes on taking the pig into his hands and looking at it through his magnifying glass suddenly discovered on the pig some astounding clue to another fearful crime then he would bring his great brain to work upon the pig but merely as a guinea pig suddenly found dead it would not interest him in my case it's different the pig was a good deal to me and this death will get round to the man who gave me the creature and he'll be sure to think i've starved it and very likely turn from me and being my godfather that would be jolly serious in fact there are several reasons why i ought to find out who has done this if i can i said it may be fate it may have died naturally he admitted this he said that's where a post-mortem would come in if it was a human being of course holmes never did post-mortems himself that not being his work but i've got to make one now it may or may not help me he made it and it didn't help him my own opinion is that he didn't much like it and hurried it a great deal he said there was no actual sign of violence on the surface of the guinea pig and the organs all seemed perfectly healthy but when i asked him what they would have looked like if they hadn't been healthy he avoided answering and went on that the pig's inside ought to have been sent up to somerset house for examination by government officials in a hermetically sealed bottle peters declared that the public has a right to demand this service for the stomachs of their old friends and relations if foul play is suspected but not in the case of a domestic beast like a guinea pig so the pig was buried and not until then did peters really seem to set to work the actual horror of the death gradually wore off and he told me that he should now seriously tackle the case there was a most unusual lack of clues he said and he pointed out that even sherlock holmes could do nothing much until clues began to turn up peters warned me against always taking it for granted that james had done it 
in fact he said it was very unlikely to have been james just because it looked so likely i said that may be the way sherlock holmes talks but it seems to me to be rather foodle and he said no may do it isn't foodle it is based on a study of the law of probabilities if you read accounts of crime you will see that as a rule the person who is suspected is innocent and the more he is suspected the more innocent he is i said anyway james has changed he's gone down four places in his class and lost his place in the second footer eleven also there's something on his mind yes said peters that's true everybody believes that he killed a valuable guinea pig and treats him accordingly that is quite enough to send him down four places in the class but if he had killed the guinea pig he would have brazened it out and have been prepared for this and taken very good care not to show what he felt in fact you don't think he killed a pig i said and peter said he didn't think james had but he was keeping an open mind then came the most extraordinary clue of the ten shilling piece happening to go to his desk one day between schools for toffee peters found in it a bit of paper lightly screwed up he opened it and discovered in it no less than a gold ten shilling piece and on the paper printed in lead pencil were these words for another guinea pig he said nothing to anybody but me but he seemed to think that i was a sort of a dr watson in my way besides it simplified the workings of his mind to talk out loud so he showed me the clue and then asked me what i thought i had rather picked up his dodge of talking like sherlock holmes so i said the first question is of course to see what is the date on the half quid i thought this pretty good but peter said this was not the first question and didn't matter in the least he said my dear maydew the money is nothing the paper in which it is wrapped up is everything so i turned to the paper what does it tell you he asked what well, tells me that some other kid did it i said for he can't spell another and he can't spell guinea pig but peter smiled and put the points of his fingers together like sherlock holmes my dear maydew he said might not that have been done on purpose then i scored off him it is just because it might have been done on purpose i said that i think it was done accidentally he nodded of course it may be the work of a kid he admitted but on the other hand it may be a subterfuge besides no kid would have killed my guinea pig where's the motive the great thing is that you've got half a sovereign and we share pocket money i said but he attached little importance to this except to say that the half sov wasn't pocket money though i might have half now examine the paper he went on i did so it was a sheet of one of our ordinary lined copy books used for dictation composition exercises and such like evidently torn out of one of the copy books i said exactly but which one ask me another i said you'll never find that out he smiled and arranged his hands again like holmes i have he said then you know on the contrary i know nothing it wasn't james's book it wasn't the first thing was to find a book with a sheet torn out i tried twenty-five books and seven had pages torn out but james's book had not then judge of my surprise may do when coming to my desk for the form of the thing and looking at my own exercise book i found a sheet was torn out and this is it for the tear fits what frightful cheek i cried out i don't so much mind that said peters but the point is that splendid though this clue seems to be on the surface i can't get any forwarder by it in fact it may be the act of a friend and not a foe what would sherlock holmes do i asked and peters gave a sort of mournful sound and scratched his head i wish i knew he said two gideon was helpful in a way but nobody could make much of it 
gideon said that it was conscience money and was often known to happen especially with the income tax because people driven to desperation by it often paid too little and then when things brighten up with them afterwards it began to weigh on their minds if they are fairly decent at heart and they remember that they have swindled the king and been dishonest and so they send the money secretly but of course feel too ashamed to say who they are i asked james if he had sent the money and he swore he hadn't but he did it in such an excitable sort of way that i was positive he had peters wouldn't believe or disbelieve he went quietly on keeping an open mind and detecting the crime and when the truth came to light peters was still detecting but in the meantime happened the mystery of the pencil sharpener and the two great mysteries were cleared up simultaneously which peters says is a common thing you couldn't say that one cleared up the other but still it did so happen that both came out in the same minute there was a boy whose name was pratt and his father was on the stock exchange of london this father used to go out to his lunch and at these times he saw many curious things sold by wandering london men who are too poor to keep shops but yet have the wish to sell things these men stand by the pavement and display most queer and uncommon curiosities such as walking spiders and such like and once from one of these men pratt's father bought quite a new sort of pencil sharpener of the rarest kind it was shaped like a stirrup and cut pencils well without breaking off the lead after a good week of this pencil sharpener pratt found it had been stolen out of his desk and he told peters about it and peters took up the case i asked him if he was hopeful and he said that there was always hope but he also said rather bitterly that it was curious what a frightful lot of hard cases he had had since coming to merivale he said it was enough to tax anybody's reputation and that each case seemed more difficult than the last i reminded him of one or two rather goodish things he had done in a small way but he said that as yet he had not really wrought off a brilliant stroke a week went by and then peters came to me in a state of frightful excitement the pencil sharpener he said have you got a clue i asked but he could hardly speak for excitement and forgot to put his hands like holmes or to try and arrange a far-away look on his face or anything not only a clue he said i know who took it this will be a great score for you when it comes out i said you swear you won't breathe a word he asked and i swore then he whispered the fearful news into my ear the doctor's taken it he said he never would i answered pratt is positive that he left it in his desk it is a case of purloining said peters and wish it had happened to anybody else but the doctor it's rather terrible in its way because if once gets this habit and yields to temptation his unlimited power who is safe it's much more a thing brown would have done i said meaning a particularly hateful roaster who wore pink ties and elastic-sided boots then peters explained that when alone in the doctor's study waiting to give a message to dr dunstan from mr briggs he chanced to look about and saw on the mantelpiece pratt's pencil sharpener and a pencil in course of being sharpened the doctor had evidently put them down there and been called away and forgotten them what did you do i inquired of peters well may do he said i asked myself what sherlock holmes would have done in confidential moments peters sometimes spoke of the great holmes as sherlock and i remembered his wonderful presence of mind he would have struck while the iron was hot as the saying is and taken the pencil sharpener there and then by jove but you didn't i said for answer peters brought the pencil sharpener out of his waistcoat pocket are you positive it's pratt's i asked absolutely certain he said it has the words made in bavaria upon it and of course this is a frightfully delicate situation to be in for me especially if the doctor asks for it i said he wouldn't dare answered peters but i've got a sort of strong feeling against letting anybody know who has done this 
on one or two occasions i believe holmes kept the doer of a dark deed a secret to give him a chance to repent it seems to me this is a case when i ought to do the same if the doctor cribs things i don't see why you should keep it dark i said and peters treated me rather rudely in fact very much like holmes sometimes treats watson my dear maydew he said the things you don't see would fill a museum anyway you'll have to give pratt back his pencil sharpener i said and he admitted that this was true the only thing that puzzled him was how to do it but after all peters didn't puzzle long he was thinking the next morning how to return the pencil sharpener to pratt in a mysterious and sherlock holmes like way when just after prayers the doctor stopped the school and spoke he said boys i have lost something and though an article of little intrinsic worth i cannot suffer it to go without making an effort to regain it i say this for two reasons the first and least is that the little contrivance so mysteriously spirited from my study is of the greatest service to me while the second and important reason your own perspicuity may perhaps suggest things do not go without hands somebody has taken from my study what did not belong to him and somebody therefore at this moment moves among you with an aching heart and a wounded conscience let that boy make his peace with god and with me before he closes his eyes and that no doubt or ambiguity may obscure the details of this event i will now descend to particulars not long ago a kindly friend conveyed to me a new form of pencil sharpener which he had chanced to find exhibited in a stationer's shop at plymouth our great naval port knowing that my eyesight is not of the best he judged this trifle would assist me in the endless task of sharpening pencils which is not the least among my minor mechanical labours and he judged correctly the implement was distinguished by a great simplicity of construction it consisted indeed of one small piece of metal somewhat resembling the first letter of the alphabet i last saw it upon the mantelpiece in the study i was actually using it when called away and on my return forgot the circumstance but upon retiring last night the incident reverted to memory while divesting myself of my apparel and so indispensable had the pencil sharpener become to me that i resumed my habiliments lighted a candle and went downstairs to seek the sharpener it had disappeared now yesterday several boys came and went as usual through the precincts of my private apartments furthermore the greek testament class will recollect that we were engaged together in the evening from seven until eight o'clock i need say no more the loss is discovered and the loss is proclaimed i accuse nobody many things may have happened to the pencil sharpener and if any boy can throw light upon the circumstance let him speak with me to-night after evening chapel i hope it may be possible to find an innocent solution of my loss but if one of you has fallen under sudden temptation and attracted by the portability and obvious advantages of the instrument has appropriated it to his own uses i must warn him that my duty will be to punish as well as pardon the hand of man however is light as compared with the anger of an outraged deity if a sinner is cowering among you at this moment with my pencil sharpener secreted about his person let that sinner lose no time but strengthen his mind to confess his sin that he may the sooner turn over a new leaf and sin no more then he booked it to breakfast and i spoke to peters and said this is pretty blue for you but he said far from it he said on the contrary may do it's blue for the doctor and it shows what he's always saying to us himself for that matter that if you do a wrong thing you've nearly always got to do another or perhaps two to bolster up the first sherlock holmes often finds out one crime owing to the criminal doing another and no doubt this has happened to the doctor he has told a deliberate carefully planned lie and a barefaced lie too because he must know that he stole the thing out of pratt's desk anyhow my course is clear i said i was glad to hear that because it didn't look at all clear to me then peters said 
i personally have got nothing to do with the doctor's wickedness in the matter in my opinion that is pratt's affair but i felt pretty sure pratt wouldn't bother about it anyway said peters i now return pratt his pencil sharpener and there my duty as the detective of the case ceases sherlock holmes often did a tremendous deed and only told the way he'd done it to watson and so it is here it is not my work to bring the doctor to justice and i'm not going to try to do it i said he was right because while he was bringing the doctor to justice he might get expelled and that wouldn't be much of a catch for anybody so the first thing after morning school we went to pratt and peters put on his holmes manner and said well pratt no news of the missing pencil sharpener i suppose and pratt said mine or the doctor's and peters said yours yes there is said pratt i found it in my lexicon two days ago i'd marked a word with it and clean forgotten so that's all right not so right as you might think i said but peters kept his nerve jolly well and in fact was more like sherlock holmes at that terrible moment than ever i saw him before or after i'm glad it's turned up said peters and i hope the doctors will then he and i went off and i congratulated him you've got a nerve of iron i said yes he said and i shall want it then he told me there was nothing like this in sherlock holmes and that the whole piece of detective work was a failure and rather a painful failure to him i don't mind the licking and so on he said but it's the inner disgrace it was a very natural mistake i said to cheer him up yes he said but detectives of the first class don't make natural mistakes nor any other sort either it's the disappointment of coming such a howler over a simple felony that is so hard at least of course it's not a felony at all if it is you did it i said and now of course you'll chuck away the pencil sharpener and sit tight about it but he shook his head no may do of course i could evade the consequences with ease if i liked but i have decided to give this back to the doctor and tell him the whole story said peters sherlock holmes would never have done that i said no he wouldn't admitted peters because why because he'd never have been such a fool as to be deluded by a false clue he knew a true clue from a false as well as we know a nice smell from a nasty one well i said if you take my advice for once you'll do this you'll leave that thing on the doctor's desk in a prominent place next time you're in there alone and you'll bury the rest in your brain holmes buried scores of things in his brain what's the sense of going out of your way to get a licking if i told him the truth i don't believe he would lick me said peters but i jolly soon showed him that was rot in fact watson never talked so straight to holmes as i did to peters then my dear chap i said you go to the doctor and say here's your pencil sharpener sir i saw it on your mantelpiece and thought you'd stolen it from pratt who has one exactly like it so i took it to give to pratt but his has turned up since well what would happen then any fool could tell you all the same peters went up next day at the appointed time and curiously enough james was in the study waiting for the doctor too the muddle that followed was explained to me by peters afterwards he and james began to talk and then james said to peters i am here peters about a very queer and sad thing and it is evidently providence that has sent you here now and peters said no it isn't i'm here about a very queer thing too and it may also turn out to be sad for me then james who was excited to a very great amount said these strange words i had come to confess that it was me killed your guinea pig i couldn't hide it any more it's haunting me not the pig but the killing of it i hoped and even prayed in my prayers that you might detect me but you didn't then i wrote home for ten shillings for a debt of honour and put it in your desk and disguised the spelling but still i was haunted by it and now as you are here i confess it openly to you that i killed your beautiful kind-hearted pig and i hope you'll forgive me for doing a beastly blackguard thing and if you can't forgive it i'll tell the doctor and get flogged rather than go on like this because it's haunting me peter said 
how did you do it and james said with poison from the laboratory mixed in his bran and peters was so much rejoiced when he heard this that he forgave the worm james on the spot that is where sending the stomach to somerset house would have come in said peters but as i was not in a position to do this i do not so much feel the slur of not having discovered you were the criminal he forgave james freely then he said you may be amused to know that i am also here about a crime i thought i'd found one out and instead of that i've jolly well committed a crime myself in fact it's about the queerest thing really that has ever happened in the annals of crime then he told the story of the pencil sharpener to james and showed james the pencil sharpener to prove it james actually had the pencil sharpener in his hand when who should come in not the doctor but the matron with the extraordinary news that the mother of peters was just arrived and had to see him at once this was so awfully surprising to peters that he went straight away to the drawing-room and left the pencil sharpener with james and in the drawing-room were the doctor and peters mother who after all had merely come to tell him that his uncle was dead but far more important things than that happened in the study because when peters arrived to see his mother the doctor having said something about bearing the shocks of life with manly fortitude went off to his study and there of course was james waiting for him and what james did we heard afterwards first on thinking it over he began to doubt why he should confess about the guinea-pig to the doctor now that peters had utterly forgiven him and he speedily decided that there was no occasion to do so but then out of gratitude to peters he determined to carry through the delicate task of getting the pencil sharpener back to the doctor and he did he told the doctor that he had taken the thing because he thought it was pratt's he said he felt sure pratt must have left it in the study by mistake but he didn't say anything about thinking the doctor had stolen it and in fact was so jolly cunning altogether that he never got into a row at all the doctor ended up by remarking that pratt's having one was a curious coincidence and he said to james as for you boy james you stand acquitted of everything but too much zeal zeal however and then he talked a lot of stuff about zeal which james did not remember i said privately to peters afterwards how would holmes have acted if this had happened to him and peters said for once i can see as clear as mud what sherlock would have done he would have said i think in this extraordinary case watson we may safely let well enough alone and that's what peters did End of story one. Story two of The Human Boy Again by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story two The Doctor's Parrot. When Johnson Maximus, young Corky's cousin, left Merivale, he went to sea, and a very curious thing happened. He went into what is called the mercantile marine, which means liners and not battleships or destroyers still you see a good deal of the world and have not got to fight for your country but only for yourself a pension is not so certain in the mercantile marine as it is in the royal navy but johnson maximus told corky when he came off a voyage from the east indies that he was hopeful he had seen a good many curious things and brought home several including a parrot chiefly gray with a good deal of red about its tail but what was far more wonderful than the parrot was the reason that johnson maximus had brought it home he had brought it home and also a very fine tiger skin as gifts to dr dunstan and when corky reminded him very naturally that he had always hated dunstan as much as anybody when he was at merivale and had been jolly thankful to leave and go on to the worcester training ship for the mercantile marine johnson maximus admitted it but confessed that looking back he had found it different and felt that dunstan was an awfully good sort and that he owed him a great deal but all the same johnson maximus never would come and see the doctor in after life 
corky asked him why and he said he wanted to remember the awe and terror of the doctor and thought if he ever saw him again it might not be the same because since the merivale days johnson had seen so many queer places and things including his own captain in the mercantile marine who johnson maximus said was himself one of the wonders of the deep of course johnson maximus left merivale long before i came there he was in fact nearly twenty when he sent the parrot by young corky and it seemed that the doctor had never had a gift from an old pupil until that time and though corky said he thought the doctor would rather have had almost anything than a parrot still it was so and he took the parrot and the tiger skin and corky told me that johnson maximus got a letter of four pages from dr dunston thanking him for these things and telling johnson many facts about parrots in general the great point about the parrot was not so much its appearance as the thing that johnson had taught it to say simply looked at from the parrot point of view it was gray with a black tongue and curious white lids to its eyes that went up and down like blinds it climbed about its cage with its claws and bill and had a way of eating nuts especially walnuts which was rather amusing we hoped that it might have learnt some sailor words and would bring them out some day when least expected but if it knew them it never spoke them it only said three words and they were rather cheek but they were rather romantic in a way when you knew what young corky knew and was able to tell me it was this that milly dunston and johnson maximus were undoubtedly engaged in secret during his last term at merivale she was just an ordinary little squirt of a girl with nothing to look round after but a lot of hair and eyes that happened to be uncommonly blue by some accident and naturally the moment johnson went into the mercantile marine she forgot him and turned her attention to other chaps until old dunston sent her to a boarding-school but she jolly soon made him let her come back again and she was back some terms before the parrot arrived then the parrot settled down and suddenly said after it had been at merivale four days dear milly dunston dear milly dunston and after that the wretched girl chucked about ten chaps and blubbed in secret for hours so corky said and let it be known to the sixth that she was true to johnson maximus because through many and many a watch on the trackless main when he ought to have been resting from his labours in the mercantile marine he had sat hour after hour by the parrot and repeated doubtless many millions of times the footing words dear milly dunston i don't think the doctor was so pleased about it as milly was certainly he did not cry and corky said if the parrot had begun by speaking dr dunston might have considered it cheek on johnson's part and sent the parrot back with the four-page letter but seeing that he had accepted it before it said dear milly dunston he couldn't well return it besides in the meantime johnson maximus had set sail for south america and steggles foretold that he would bring another parrot back from there which he might train to say something even stronger he told milly so and rose her hopes a good deal but steggles also told her that she needn't get excited about it because her father would never let her marry a chap in the mercantile marine and that sailors have a wife in every port this was that same steggles who did many things at merivale in the past but he was now exceedingly old and expected at any time to be taken away many believed he was nearly eighteen but he had nothing much to show it except experience the first thing to do was to give the parrot a name and milly told us in triumph that she had made the doctor call it joe of course this was the christian name of johnson maximus though i believe the doctor had quite forgotten that anyway joe is a very good name for a parrot and everybody got very fond of him and old briggs lectured on him and told us that parrots reach a great age and have often been known to live a hundred years and more owing to their healthy diet and the number of bites they take to each mouthful and their habit of never worrying whatever happens old briggs himself is frightfully keen about fruit and nuts and such things and i believe in secret he hopes he'll live a hundred years too 
but nobody else does steggles discovered a likeness between joe and old briggs they shut their eyes in the same way certainly but joe's eyes were like grey diamonds and old briggs's through many years of looking through microscopes at seeds and bits of seaweeds and stones and so on have got a sort of film over them and are not up to much now even with two pairs of spectacles to help them well joe was as good a parrot as ever you saw and there is no doubt that he would have outlived everybody at merivale and got to be a sort of heirloom in dr dunstan's family if he had been spared but after he had been there two years at the beginning of his seventh term in fact the great and sorrowful death of the parrot took place and such was the general feeling about him that there would certainly have been a public funeral if the doctor had allowed it mathers went further and wanted it to be a military funeral and have the cadet corps out with reversed muskets but mathers who is merely mathers minimus really though his brothers have long since left is a chap who is like a girl in some ways being easily made to laugh or cry to show you the peculiar sort of ass he is i may say that he always writes home letters of dreadful anguish at the beginning of the term and then when the holidays really do come seems never to want to go home at all trelawney says this is contrary to nature and will end in pure insanity for mathers but fowl on the other hand says that mathers is already mad i heard brown the mathematical master speak about matthews too to mannering a new undermaster they were watching mathers in the playground and he was in one of his most cheerful moods and imitating a monkey on a barrel organ catching fleas he certainly did it jolly well and even a chap or two from the sixth stopped to watch and then when he saw these chaps looking on he got above himself and began playing the giddy ox and spoilt the show then it was that brown gave his opinion of mathers and said that he had the artistic temperament whatever that may be anyway it is no catch for though boys laugh at you they despise you and so do masters masters never seem to have the artistic temperament much or if they have had it they get well over it after being masters a few terms i suppose it was the artistic temperament that made mathers join the cadet corps which he did do chiefly that he might wear the red bags with black stripes and drill once a week under the sergeant he was rather small and it took all his strength to carry the musket around for the corps had twenty-five old muskets and i believe it was a regular military affair under government in a sort of vague way anyhow we had percussion caps for the muskets and fired them off at times in the course of the drill and the first time that young mathers had a musket with caps he turned rather white hating explosions and noise of all kinds and said out loud in the face of the corps to the drill sergeant who stood in front of the brigade is it loaded sergeant the sergeant who was old and had seen battle and had a grey moustache and medals and a fierce expression looked at him and merely said good god boy do you think i should be standing here if it was then he spat a scornful spit and twirled his moustache and seemed to think he'd come down a good deal in the world to have to drill kids like mathers so always afterwards if anybody wanted to rot mathers and most people did they had only to say is it loaded sergeant and he instantly became depressed and mournful or got into a frightful bait one or other according to his frame of mind at the time i am telling you all these things about mathers for two reasons first because he is the principal person after joe in this story and secondly because he was my chum my name is blount well known at dunstan's as having had diphtheria and two doctors in my first term and recovering what i saw in mathers i never could tell but there was something about the piffling duffer that i liked his good nature was very marked and he was peculiarly generous of dried fruits which drew me to him as much as anything his father was a merchant and traded with various foreign places especially celebrated for dried fruits and in this manner much grand tuck 
that ordinary people have to pay pretty stiffly for such as candied melons and crystallized pineapples and other amazing food very seldom seen in a general way came to bunny mathers as a matter of course from time to time and he thought no more of opening a hamper and finding the richest and rarest things in it than i should of getting a windfall from our apple orchard this provender he gave to his friends and to those he wanted to be his friends and some became his friends in consequence but their friendship as mathers rather bitterly pointed out to me sank to nothing between the times of the hampers whereas i made mathers a real chum and once when owing to some fearful crisis in the sugared violet trade with france his father forgot for six weeks to send mathers any hamper at all i remained unchanged then the parrot died and naturally the first question was why we had a debate on it our public debates are listened to by the doctor and the masters and the subjects are chosen by them but sometimes we have private debates that are not listened to and we had one on joe and the government led by macmullen our champion debater held that joe had died a natural death and the opposition led by richmond thought he had died by treachery on a division the government was defeated by two votes owing to the magnificent speech of richmond and steggles said there ought to be an inquest and a post-mortem and so did peters who was positive the death was a murder the mystery was who could have done it because joe had not an enemy in the world unless it was mrs dunstan's cat which he mimicked to its face and then barked suddenly and made the cat think there was a dog after her but this cat could not have done it the parrot was found dead in its cage on the morning of a day in february it was quite stiff and dignified no cat had touched him mathers said it cut him to the heart to think of poor joe falling off his perch in the dead of night and lying helpless there and perhaps calling for help he said if there had been loving hands to give it a drop of brandy and put its claws in mustard and water it might be among us yet and he went on in such a harrowing way and thought such sad ideas that at last i had to smack his head and make him shut up there was no inquest and no post-mortem for the doctor refused to have joe examined much to our astonishment in fact we thought it was rather unsportsmanlike of the doctor to hustle joe into his grave so jolly quickly the corpse disappeared and the doctor was slightly changed for several days he had got very fond of the bird and i think he missed hearing it say dear milly dunstan dear milly dunstan which it did hundreds of times in the day when it was feeling well and happy then a week after joe was buried came the marvellous determination of mathers for the first time in his life i felt a sort of pride in mathers and was glad to be his chum at the same time the danger was frightful and i had no idea what the end might be only two people knew it milly and myself i rather advised him against it but she was hot and strong for it so mathers went ahead into a regular sea of danger not that he did it for milly far from it he did it for himself and to advance his prosperity with the doctor his prosperity with the doctor was extremely low and he had made one mistake already by offering the doctor half a box of dates in a rather patronizing way and so now it was neck or nothing and mathers well knew the frightful risks he ran in the thing he was going to do he said i always make a success or an utter failure at games in class and everything either this will make me the doctor's friend for life or make him my bitter enemy for life the idea in the strange mind of bunny mathers was to bring joe back again to merivale he could not raise him from the dead but he meant to do the next best thing and dig him up and secretly stuff him only mathers could have imagined this though there were one or two other chaps equal to doing the thing if somebody else had thought of it i said to mathers what do you know about stuffing parrots and he said more than you might think he had read the article on stuffing beasts in the encyclopaedia britannica which briggs allowed him to refer to little knowing the reason and he said that stuffing was simpler than embalming and that his brother mathers minor had often stuffed bats and moles and other things in the holidays at home 
he told me that all you want for bird stuffing is wire cotton wool and pepper and for sixpence he could get all these things in great abundance milly dunstan knew where joe was buried and the only difficulty in the opinion of mathers was digging him up for some reason though he did not shrink from the horrors of getting joe ready for the stuffing treatment he hated the digging up so i undertook to do this there was little danger as joe had been buried in a secluded rockery under a large fern where nobody ever went milly showed me the spot on a half holiday when i was supposed to be stopping in owing to bronchitis or something of that sort and i popped out got a trowel from the gardener's potting shed and dug up joe he had been very nicely buried in a large empty tobacco tin of browns and i also made the grave look all right again and put back the wooden gravestone milly had stuck this up and on it freckles had carved for her the rather sad words to the memory of darling joe died seventh february nineteen o one age unknown regretted by all owing to the weather being frosty and the ground simply full of splinters of ice joe had fortunately kept perfectly this comforted mathers a good deal and when i told him the poor old chap was not even gamey he was much pleased he worked in fearful secrecy at night and kept joe in his play-box by day most of the actual work was done at the passage window by moonlight and when the moon was no good which happened in two days we used a candle end once the pepper got up our noses and we both sneezed in a way to wake half the dormitory but nobody suspected and the work was gradually done i merely held things and advised the actual stuffing was entirely the work of bunny when joe was once ready for the cotton wool the stuffing was as simple as possible and owing to his toughness we easily sewed up his chest afterwards but the thing was to get him to look as if he was alive this is evidently the great difficulty in the stuffer's art and mathers had not mastered it by any means from the encyclopaedia britannica i said for a first attempt it is spiffing but all the same joe never looked like that in life or death he is now as it were neither dead or alive mathers admitted this he said he thought it was the want of the eyes and that all would come right when they were in i asked him where he was going to get the eyes and he said he was going to write to the great rowland ward for them this he did do and they sent a pair of most lifelike parrot's eyes and only charged three bob the eyes did a great deal for joe and certainly made him look alive but it was a strange sort of unearthly life i thought they made him look creepy as if he was a ghost risen from the tomb to haunt somebody who had killed him also about this time we had to get some condes fluid to steady poor old joe down a bit i thought this was serious but mathers said not he assured me that condes fluid is an everyday thing in stuffing parrots and such like and then i had an idea and got my anti-something tooth powder which also helped and so it came to be some use after all which tooth powder seldom is we varnished the claws and tried to stick back a lot of feathers that unfortunately came out in the process of stuffing then i got a bit of wood and a stick for a perch and we wired joe on and put a walnut at his feet which was a good thought of bunny's because walnuts were always his favorite food then from being very confident and hopeful and full of the doctor's joy and gladness when he should see the parrot mathers sank suddenly into a sort of state of despair he couldn't get the wings right and he said the thought of them tortured him day and night and sent him down three places in his class at each attempt more feathers fell out and finally i got impatient with mathers and told him that if he messed about with the parrot any more the thing would fall to pieces and fail utterly i also reminded him that the matron when passing by the play-boxes the day before had thought there must be a dead mouse behind the wainscot things were in fact coming to a climax and i said that if he'd had the pluck to stuff joe i hoped after all the fearful danger and swat he'd had that he would keep on to the end and give him to the doctor and trust to luck that it would come off all right 
then he lost all heart about it and said that milly should decide but he was not fair to her and only showed her the head the rest he hid from her in a bath towel of course the head was the champion part owing to the eyes from roland ward she cried first but in a general way she was delighted she praised mathers and she also said that it would be well to present it quickly to the doctor so that he could get some proper professional staffer to finish it and put a glass case over it as soon as possible of course a glass case was beyond our power still mathers hesitated then urged by me he decided to have a second opinion he said i don't like steggles but he is the oldest and therefore the wisest boy in the school i will show him the work and put myself entirely into his hands there's a fearful risk i replied because steggles doesn't care for man or beast and if he sees a chance to have some frightful score off you he will no he won't answered bunny i shall throw myself on his sportsmanlike feeling he hasn't got any i said but he risked it and for once steggles behaved less like a common or garden cad than usual we showed him the parrot after making him take an oath of secrecy the oath would have been merely a matter of form with him generally for i have known him to break a blood oath as if it was nothing but somehow the excited state of mathers and the extraordinary thing that he had done took the fancy of steggles and he showed a great deal of interest in the parrot and gave us some jolly good advice into the bargain of course he rotted mathers when he got over the shock of the surprise he struck an attitude of horror and fear and terror and said great snakes is it loaded sergeant then he pretended it was a ghost and finally he held his nose and fainted after all this foolery mathers asked him for his candid opinion and steggles very kindly gave it he said if you take my advice you'll instantly bury it again for two reasons firstly because if the doctor sees it he'll probably expel you and secondly because if you don't the whole school will jolly soon be down with a fell disease to show you what mathers is after hearing this nothing in the world would make him bury the parrot again he said that it was a cruel thing after all the danger and trouble and expense of stuffing joe that steggles should advise him just to bury him again he also said that the slight scent was purely medicinal and that as for expelling if the doctor could really and truly go so far as to expel a boy who had done nothing but try with all his might to give him a moment of great and sudden happiness then the sooner he was expelled and sent to another sort of school the better in fact he was so worked up by the idea of reburying the parrot that he decided he would carry joe before the doctor the very next day either immediately before or after prayers steggles merely said that mathers was young and headstrong and he hoped that he should be there to see then he went and bunny and i had a long talk as to whether before or after prayers would be best i said after prayers on a litany morning because the litany always leaves the doctor weak but in a very kind and gentle state whereas before prayers he is sometimes rather short therefore it was so and after the next litany morning mathers went up as bold as brass to the eye and in his hand he carried joe hidden under a clean pocket handkerchief lent by me the doctor had just shut his big prayer book and he looked down pretty kindly at bunny what have you there mathers minimus he asked little knowing the nature of the thing that was going to burst upon his gaze please sir said bunny it's poor old joe dr dunston didn't seem to remember poor old joe what do you mean boy he asked in a changed tone of voice the parrot sir i thought i thought it was a pity he should be lost to you being a beautiful object and i in fact uh, here he is sir stuffed by me and the slight smell is medicinal said mathers then he drew off the handkerchief and held the parrot up to the doctor certainly it was a great effect and at first the doctor was evidently far too astonished to be much obliged to mathers he didn't take the parrot on the contrary he fell back a pace or two 
and his astonishment seemed slowly to change to a sort of wild horror first he looked at the parrot then he looked at mathers then he regularly glared at the parrot again seen from a distance the effect of the parrot was not good evidently we had lost more feathers than we thought and its back had got a lump between the shoulders more really like a vulture than a parrot still of course one could recognize it mathers held it up then getting frightened he put it down on a form and i knew from the trembling way he began to handle my handkerchief that if the doctor didn't speak pretty soon mathers would blub in public these silences of the doctor's are well known as awful you can hear a pin drop in them and during them his eyes roll round and round in the sockets like catherine wheels but much slower at last he spoke am i to understand boy mathers that unaided you you dug up or disinterred that unfortunate fowl and then sought to impart to it this bizarre this grotesque this indelicate semblance of life mathers said he was to understand that he added with a shaking voice i, I did it to give you a pleasure sir on oh, my honour the doctor looked at mathers minimus much puzzled it is hard to conceive that even an immature mind such as you possess could suppose that pleasure would result to any intelligent being from so pitiful and indecent an achievement he said the boy who tore this wretched bird from its last resting place and set it up to caricature the entire race of Siticus erythicus however this is no time to investigate your conduct mathers you will join me after evening school in the study then he looked at the parrot again and cleared his throat mathers slunk away to his seat and as he did so suddenly the doctor started and seemed to point like a sporting dog i think he had discovered there was more than met the eye about the parrot he called up mcmullen who happened to catch his gaze and told him to take joe to the gardener direct smith to place these remains in the spot i originally selected he said and if anybody ventures to disturb them again the consequences will be exceedingly serious now go to your classes he waved his hand and mcmullen took the parrot and nobody ever saw it again but to this day mather swears that smith never buried him he believes that in some secret place in his house the gardener has joe in a glass case because very truly he says that no ordinary gardener would be likely to resist the temptation of having a rare and beautiful bird to decorate his house besides the glass eyes also it is well known that dr dunstan never goes into the gardener's house which is really the entrance lodge to merivale and is full of smith's wife and children so i dare say bunny is right there he told me afterwards that dunstan was very cold but not actively angry in the evening mathers said that the doctor didn't seem to attach any importance to the fact that he'd stuffed joe to give him a great and sudden pleasure instead he evidently thought that bunny had done a rather daring thing to please himself unseemly was the word he used said mathers to me he seemed to think it was not a case for much punishment but all the same he has told me to write out the article on the stuffer's art from the encyclopaedia britannica which is rather rot because i shall certainly never want to stuff anything again in this world i couldn't tell him all i'd been through to do it because he'd got a sort of beastly idea that i liked doing it though you know that it was nothing of the sort on the whole it has left him against me and he seems to take a good deal of credit to himself for not making a lot more row about it but whether he's going to let it rankle in his mind so that i may suffer for it more or less till the end of the term or whether when i've done the import he'll feel as usual just neither for me nor against me i can't say yet he might have tried to look at it from my point of view you could hardly expect him to do that masters never do i said 
it's all the worse for him anyway answered mathers minimus to rebury the parrot was a slight on me in a way because whether he liked it or not he could have seen at a glance the hours and hours of awful trouble and the fearful expense it must have been to me the eyes alone were three shillings and nobody in this world ever threw away valuable money in such a cruel manner besides if it had gone off well and he'd taken it as i meant it i fully intended other good surprises for him you'd better not surprise him again for a jolly long time i said he doesn't much like surprises people don't when they grow up they have a footling way of preferring everything to drag on in a tame and dull manner my father hates telegrams for instance i had fully meant to get johnson to bring him another and a better parrot said mathers even a pair of parrots might have been arranged and they would have made a nest about april and laid eggs and there would gradually have been parrots for all his daughters and he could have taught them what he liked even to the extent of latin for it is well known that a parrot will learn anything but it's all over now never again will i try to give him pleasure or anybody else either why even milly hasn't pitied me much just because it's all a failure whereas if he'd taken it in a manly way and thanked me before the school and perhaps given us a half holiday or something and sent the parrot off at once to be measured for a glass case how different it all would have been nobody would have called me body snatcher then whereas now i shall be called that for life which was all true enough in its way and he was called body snatcher forevermore whereas to show what mistakes happen i'd done that part simply as a friend end of story two story three of the human boy again by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story three the bankruptcy of bannister one i am bannister and what happened to me was a very gradual thing at first but it grew and grew until finally something had to be done and that something was called bankruptcy curiously enough i had heard the word before at home in fact as i told gideon who kindly let me explain my position to him my father had once been bankrupted and when he was a bankrupt my mother cried a good deal and my father talked about everlasting disgrace and a bloodthirsty world and something in the pound and then there came a day when my father told my mother gladly that he had been discharged whatever that was and my mother seemed much pleased in fact she said thank god gerald and they had a bottle of champagne for lunch it was in holidays and i heard it all and tasted the champagne and didn't like it so remembering this when gideon talked of me being a bankrupt i said all right and the sooner the better as i say one gets hard up very gradually and the debts seem nothing in themselves but when owing to chaps bothering you go into it all on paper you may often be much surprised to find how serious things are taken altogether what i found was that my pocket-money was absolutely all owed for about three terms in advance and that steggles who lent me a shilling upon a thing called a mortgage the mortgage being my bat was not going to give up my bat which was a spliced bat and cost eight shillings and sixpence he said what with interest and one thing and another his shillings had gained six shillings more and that if he didn't take the bat at once he would be out of pocket so he took it and he played with it in a match and got a cluck's egg and i was jolly glad then the tuck woman who is allowed to come up to the playground after school with fruit and sweets and such like was owed by me seven shillings and fourpence and she wouldn't sell anything more to me and asked me rather often to pay the money i told her that all would be paid sooner or later and she seemed inclined not to believe it other debts were one and six owed to corky minimus for a mouse that he said was going to have young mice but it didn't and he had consented to take ninepence owing to being mistaken tin lin chow the chinese boy was owed four shillings and threepence for a charm it was a good enough charm made of ivory and carved into a very hideous face 
all the same it never had done me much good for here i was bankrupted six months after buying it and the charm itself not even paid for there was a lot of other small debts some merely a question of pens and caterpillars but they all mounted up and so i felt something must be done because being in such a beastly mess kept me awake a good deal at night thinking what to do therefore i went to gideon who is a jew and very rich and well known to lend money at interest he is first in the whole school for arithmetic and his father is a diamond merchant and a banker and many other things that bring in enormous sums of money gideon has no side and he is known to be absolutely fair and kind even to the smallest kids so i went to him and said please gideon if it won't be troubling you i would like to speak to you about my affairs i am very hard up in fact and fellows are being rather beastly about money i owe them i'm afraid i can't finance you bannister said gideon awfully kindly my money's all out at interest just now and as a matter of fact i'm rather funky about some of it i don't want you to finance me i said and that would be jolly poor fun for you anyway because i've got nothing and never shall have in this world as far as i can see i only want you to advise me i'm fourteen and three-quarters and when i was twelve and a half my father got into pretty much the same mess that i'm in now and he got out again with ease and even had champagne afterwards by the simple plan of being bankrupt oh, it's not always an honourable thing i warn you of that said gideon i'm sure it was perfectly honourable in my father's case i said because he's a frightfully honourable man and i am honourable too and want to do what is right and proper as soon as possible why don't you write to your father asked gideon because he once warned me when he was being bankrupted in fact that if ever i owed any man a farthing he would break my neck and my mother said at the same time blubbing into a handkerchief as she said it that she would rather see me in my coffin than in the bankruptcy court all the same they both cheered up like anything after it was all over and father said he should not hesitate to go through it all again if necessary but still i wouldn't for the world tell them what i've done in fact they think that i have money in hand and subscribe to the chapel offertories and do all sorts of good with my ten bob a term whereas the truth is that i have to pay it all away instantly on the first day of the term and have had to ever since two terms after i first came what you must do then is to go bankruptive a watch and you have that chinese charm you bought from tin ling chow and various other things including the green lizard you found on the common last saturday if it's still alive i can't give up the watch i said it isn't mine it's only lent to me by my mother the lizard died yesterday i'm sorry to say owing to not liking captivity well at any rate the thing is to declare something in the pound gideon told me it may be i said but first get your pound you can't declare anything in the pound if you haven't got a pound at least i don't see how he seemed doubtful about that and changed the subject anyway i'll be at the meeting of creditors he promised and i felt sure he would be because gideon was never known to lie Two a good deal happened before the meeting of creditors among other things i went down three places in my form because my mind was so much occupied with going bankrupt and i also got into a beast of a row with the doctor which was serious and might have been still more serious if he had insisted on knowing the truth it was at a very favourite lesson of the doctor's namely the scripture lesson and as a rule he simply takes the top of the class and leaves the bottom pretty much alone because at the top are macmullen and richmond and prodgers all flyers at scripture and their answers gave the doctor great pleasure and at the bottom are me and wilson minor and west and others and our answers don't give him any pleasure at all but sometimes he pounces down upon us with a sudden question to see if we are attending and he pounced down upon me to see if i was attending and i was not because my mind was full of the meeting of creditors who were more important to me for the minute than the people in the old testament so when the doctor suddenly said tell us what you know of gideon bannister if you please i clean forgot there was more than one gideon and said gideon is an awfully decent sort sir and he has advised me to offer something in the pound 
naturally the doctor did not like this in fact he liked it so little that he made me go straight out of the class and wait for him in his study then he caned me for insolence combined with irreverence and made me write out about gideon and the dew upon the fleece twenty-four times which i did i also asked our gideon if he was by any chance related to the bible gideon and he said that it was impossible to prove that he was not and that it was also impossible to prove that he was in any case he said such things did not trouble him though a friend of his father's wanting to prove that he was related to a man who died in the year seven thirty four a d went to a place called the herald's office and gave them immense sums of money and they proved it easily he said also that it was a jolly good thing the doctor did not ask for particulars because if he had known that i was a bankrupt and just about to offer something in the pound he would probably have expelled me on the spot gideon asked me if i had done anything about the bankruptcy and i told him privately that i had but i did not tell him what i had in fact taken a desperate step and written a letter to my grandmother i marked it private in three places and begged her on every page not to tell my father because my father was her son and he had often told me that if i wrote to her for money he would punish me in a very terrible manner how he never mentioned but he meant it and so i had to make my grandmother promise not to tell him i wrote the letter seven or eight times before i got it up to the mark then i borrowed one of foster's envelopes already stamped with pink stamps for writing home and sent it off it was the best letter i ever wrote or ever shall write and this is how it went my dear grandmother i write this line though very busy to hope that you are exceedingly well and enjoying the fine weather i hope your lovely little clever dog fido is well also i never see such a clever and beautiful dog anywhere else my parents write to me that they are well i am quite well at least i am quite well in body though i have grown rather thin lately through not being able to eat enough food this is not the fault of the food it is my mind you will be very sorry to hear dear grandmother that i am a bankrupt i hope you may never know what it is to be one for it is very terrible especially if you are honourable and honest as i am owing to the books you always give me so very kindly at christmas to be a bankrupt is to be called upon at any moment to have to pay something in the pound and this is a dreadful position but even more dreadful in my case than in some others for instance when dear father was bankrupted he paid something in the pound and had plenty over for a bottle of champagne but in my case i have not got the pound i don't mean of course my dear granny that i want anybody to give me the pound but the terrible thing is i can't be a bankrupt without it and so really i don't know what will happen to me if i don't get it if by any wonderfully kind and lucky chance you could lend me a pound my dreadful situation would of course improve at once and i should no doubt get fatter and cheerfuller in a few days but as it is i lie awake and sigh all night and even wake chaps with the loudness of my sighs which fling things at me for keeping them awake but i cannot help it i don't tell you these things to worry you dear granny as very likely you have worries of your own but it would not be honest not to tell you how badly i want a pound just for the moment there is to be a meeting of my creditors in the gymnasium in a few days and how am i going to declare anything in the pound i don't know it makes me feel terribly old and i have gone down several places in my class and been terribly caned by dr dunstan but nothing matters if i can honourably get that pound it would change the whole course of my life in fact my beautiful bat has gone you will be sorry to hear owing to a mortgage and i hope you may never know what a mortgage is i have to borrow it now when i play cricket but i am playing very badly this term because you cannot be in good form if the brain is worrying about a pound i shall lose my place in the second eleven i expect i have missed several catches lately and i fancy my eyes are growing dim and old owing to being awake worrying so much at night about that pound 
of course if you can give any sort of idea where i can get that pound i shall be very thankful unfortunately in this case five shillings would be no good and even ten would be no good strange though it may seem only a pound is any use i must now conclude my dear granny with best love and good wishes from your very affectionate grandson arthur mortimer bannister p s though all this fearful brain worry has thrown me back a lot in class still my scripture is all right and i shall be able to say the kings of israel either backwards or forwards next holidays in a way that i hope will surprise you i have been a good deal interested in gideon and the dew upon the fleece lately well i sent off this ripping letter which was far far the longest and best i had ever written in my life and before sending it i printed at the top of each page don't tell father feeling that to be very important then i waited and hoped that my grandmother would read the letter in the way i meant her to and great was my relief when i found that she had on the very morning of the meeting of creditors she wrote a whacking long letter and sent a postal order for a pound and the letter i put away for future reading and the postal order i took to mr thwaites who always changes postal orders into money for boys he seemed surprised at the great size of the postal order but gave me a golden pound and told me to be careful of it i was so excited that i very nearly got kept in at morning school but i escaped and when the time came i went to gideon and he walked up to the gym with me to meet the creditors three ten chaps were assembled for the bankruptcy but i jolly soon cleared out stepford because the sixpence he said i owed him had been paid at the beginning of the term and westcott was able to prove it so stopford went but reluctantly steggles also went he wanted me to take back my mortgaged bat and owe him about six shillings instead but knowing steggles i felt sure that something must have gone wrong with the bat and when i examined it i found that it was so in fact the bat was badly sprung and gideon said it was like steggles and a beastly paltry thing to try to do so steggles also went and that left eight fellows these eight chaps were told to make their claims and when they had gideon made me examine them to see they were all right only four claimed too much and mathers who is an awfully kind-hearted chap claimed too little so i said i'm afraid i owe you one and nine not one and three mathers and he said that's all right i knocked off a tanner when you won the house match against brown a week ago which shows the sort of chap that mathers was i said does anybody else feel inclined to knock off anything owing to my winning the house match against brown's but nobody did and seeing that five of the creditors actually belonged to brown's house i couldn't expect that they would when you've admitted the claims said gideon i'll add them up myself so i went through the claims and had to admit them all then gideon added them up and said the claims lodged against you bannister amount to exactly one pound twelve shillings and eightpence but i think you told me that the tuck woman was also a creditor if so she ought to be here i have spoken to her i said and she says that i owe her seven shillings and fourpence that is the figure i told her that i was going to have a meeting of creditors and she said i was beginning early and that she wished she could let me off but that she had an invalid husband and twenty small children at home or some such number then the debt ranks good said gideon so he added the seven and fourpence to the pound twelve shillings and eightpence the total liabilities are exactly two pounds said gideon now bannister as the debts are admitted to be two pounds the next question is what are the assets i may tell you kids he continued turning to corky minimus and fairlawn and frost who were the smallest of the creditors in size and age that the word assets which you very likely do not know means what bannister has got to pay you with you have made him a bankrupt and he owes you two pounds so now the simple question is how much can he pay of that money of course he can't pay it all else he wouldn't be a bankrupt but he is going to pay according to his assets now bannister he concluded turning to me you'd better tell the meeting what your assets are does everybody understand 
everybody understood or said they did except frost and he kept on saying over and over again like a parrot five pence and a lead pencil five pence and a lead pencil till gideon at last had to tell him to shut up and not interfere with the meeting then i spoke i said in a finite quiet sort of way as if it was an everyday thing i have decided to pay something in the pound gideon but gideon was rather impatient we all know that that's what we're here for he said you couldn't all know it i answered because none of you know that i've got a pound you can't pay something in the pound unless you've got one and i thought it might interest the creditors at this meeting to know that i have got one they were frightfully interested naturally and even gideon was i put it into his hand and he looked at it and turned it over and nodded the assets are a pound said gideon i've no doubt you'll all be glad to hear that the chaps evidently felt very different to me when they heard the assets were a pound because most of them as they told me afterwards didn't know there were any assets at all they got rather excited in fact and fowl even asked if there might be any more assets but i said no there is only this pound when i became bankrupt i determined that i would pay something in the pound and i wrote to private friends and put the position before them and they quite agreed with me and sent the pound and now i am going to pay something in it i don't quite know what that means but it is an honourable and proper thing to do and gideon does know what it means and i shall be very much obliged to him if he will say what i am to pay in it it is quite easy said gideon you have a debt you can't pay it all so you pay so much in the pound that's what i'm going to do i said the question is how much you're going to pay in the pound said forrest who had much more row than all the rest of the creditors put together though i only owed him a penny i know that's the question without your telling me i answered gideon has the pound and he will say what i am to pay in it gideon looked rather puzzled you don't seem to understand even yet bannister he said you don't pay so much in the pound of the assets you pay so much in the pound of the debts i didn't pretend to understand what gideon meant by this complicated way of putting it and told him so all i want i said is to do the strictly honourable thing and pay so much in the pound which i have handed over to gideon for that reason but gideon much to my surprise seemed to feel rather annoyed at this i wish you'd try and understand the situation he said when you speak of so much in the pound it's a figure of speech in a sort of way it isn't a real single solitary pound it's real enough i said thwaites gave it to me in exchange for a postal order this pound is real but then gideon broke off in a helpless sort of way and then he began again you owe two pounds do you see that of course i said that's the whole thing and you've got one pound do you see that he held it up as if he was going to do a conjuring trick with it of course i said i did see it then if you owe two pounds and can only find one how much are you going to pay in the pound whatever you think would be sportsmanlike gideon i said it isn't a question of being sportsmanlike it's a question of simple arithmetic he said you've got twenty shillings and you owe forty you owe just twice as many as you've got therefore it follows that you'll pay ten shillings in the pound and that's a good deal more than many people can i'll pay more than that i said i'll pay fifteen shillings what an ass you are bannister answered gideon you can't pay fifteen shillings you haven't got it to pay my dear chap i said i've got a pound you've got nothing at all he said you pay ten shillings in each of the two pounds you owe and then there's nothing left after that i began to see and when we went into it all and got change and paid each chap exactly half of what i owed him it turned out that gideon was perfectly right and there wasn't a farthing left over everybody was fairly well satisfied except the tuck woman but nobody seemed much obliged to me and i couldn't help thinking that though gideon had been awfully decent about it and managed it all frightfully well nevertheless a grown man would have managed it even better because take my father's bankruptcy and look how jolly different that turned out to mine 
i don't know what he paid in the pound but i do know there was enough left over for him to buy a bottle of champagne and for my mother to say thank god whereas my bankruptcy appeared to have left me exactly where i was before and there was nothing whatever left over to buy even a bottle of ginger beer i pointed this out to gideon and he said of course i don't know how much your father paid in the pound presently i said i'm awfully obliged to you gideon and i shall never forget how kind you have been and i wonder if you'd mind adding to your fearful kindness by lending me a penny what for said gideon ginger beer no i said for a stamp to write to my grandmother i may tell you privately that she sent that pound out of her own money and that it was very sporting of her and of course i must thank her gideon didn't much like it i could see but at last he brought out the penny and entered it in his book if you can pay it back by the end of the term i'll charge no interest he said and just to show what luck gideon always has the very next sunday at church i found a threepenny piece doubtless dropped by somebody so gideon had his penny back in three days and i went so far as to offer him a halfpenny interest but he would not take it from me End of story three.